Hello and a warm welcome from Lagos. It's nice to have you with us for this new edition of Echo Africa, the environmental magazine brought to you by DW in Germany, Uganda's NTV and Channels TV right here in Nigeria. I'm Chris Alems and with me is my charming colleague in Kampala. Hi Chris and a big hello to all of you, our viewers out there. I am Sandra Twinovio and as always, we have a lot of interesting reports lined up for you today. Here's a quick look at what is in store. Why vertical farming is good for cities. How large stones help preserve topsoil. And why hyenas in Namibia are worth protecting. We do start the program right here in Uganda. Like many cities in Africa, Kampala is densely populated. And as people continue to move to the capital, a lot of families end up living in cramped conditions. Now, one man who grew up in an informal settlement himself is now helping others make the most of their limited space. <music> Even after five years on the job, Paul Matovu never tires of producing his custom-made wooden vertical farms. So a vertical farm is basically a farm in a box. So we basically make these trees and we stack them together vertically uh, to, create, to create enough planting space. And that is something that's disappearing in urban areas. Over a quarter of Uganda's population, around 12 million people live in cities. Many of capital Kampala's residents are in informal settlements. Matovu has already delivered about 2,000 of his box farms, mostly to poor areas. The businessman knows from personal experience how precious space can be. People should be aware that there are other ways of growing food in the urban areas. The vertical farm provides such a solution and we want as more people as possible to be aware that we can use vertical farms to grow foods in the small and uh, you know, limited available space that we have in urban areas. Some vertical farmers live in the Bulenga district on Kampala's outskirts. Angela Kokusima has grown herbs and vegetables behind her home for two years. <laughs> I grow celery because it is really good when I use it as a salad. It is also good for your health. She doesn't need to worry about buying fertilizer as she simply makes compost from her neighbor's vegetable scraps and she can sell her surplus. I earn some income to buy small items like soap. I can even save a bit of money. I sell to my neighbors. I don't have to look for customers. But the wood products are expensive. A five-tray system costs the equivalent of 100 euros, which is unaffordable for many families. That's why Paul Matovu has sought sponsors, mostly international organizations who subsidize the costs for poor residents. The young entrepreneur has won several awards for his vertical farms, and he takes every opportunity to promote his innovative concept. We have found that very many young people are interested in farming. They want to learn and they want to be engaged. So the reason uh, we are here is to, one, communicate with the young people, but also interest them in the products and services that we offer. One of his customers is a large hotel in Kampala. Vertical farms cover 15 square meters of its backyard. Gardener Charles Chambade grows herbs and spices here, such as coriander and rosemary, as well as tomatoes and onions. For our clients uh, who like Oga, oga, organic vegetables, uh, those who have had a chance to, to look at this garden, they feel they're in the right place. They already have a program where they're training young people and empowering them to practice urban farming. They also welcome uh, people from outside to come and learn about uh, urban farming. So they're already leading by example, and I would call upon other hotels to, to learn from Fairway Hotel. Paul Matovo has hired six workers. When demand is high, he occasionally hires more. The ambitious social entrepreneur is already planning his next project. 
He wants to build vertical farms for a refugee camp in Uganda together with the help of an NGO. What a great way to supply cities with fresh produce. Farming is traditionally a rural occupation, but conditions in the countryside are changing and many regions have been devastated by drought. That is unfortunately true. One dramatic example of that can be seen in Turkana County in northern Kenya, already one of the driest regions on earth. The situation has become particularly critical in recent years, making conflict over resources even worse. A water source. When the one in Lokutan Amala's village ran dry, she had no choice but to relocate. Now she and her neighbors have resettled in Cthulhu. They rebuilt their huts near a well, but they need more than water to survive. Look, everything is empty. We have nothing to eat. It's empty. The last five days, I didn't have anything to eat. Sometimes I slept on an empty stomach. It was only this morning that the World Vision gave me corn. Even if it's only corn, I'm still happy I can make something to eat. Drought is devastating the Takana region of northeastern Kenya. The latest UN report is alarming. Its former pastures have become arid land. Rainfall has decreased by more than two thirds in the past six months. And with temperatures hovering at around 40 degrees Celsius, Livestock farmers can only look on as their animals die. Even camels are succumbing to the heat. The drought is killing our animals. First the goats, cows and donkeys died. Now it's even camels too, which are more resilient. We're scared that it will be the people here in Torkana who die next because we leave from animal breeding. The camel breeder has already lost 29 animals. Financially, it's a disaster. Camels usually cost seven to 900 euros each. In Kenya alone, some one and a half million animals died in the second half of last year. The biggest problem is the water shortage. Ninety-five percent of open water sources in Turkana today are dry. There is abnormal migration patterns among the pastoralists. School retention rates are low because when pastoralists move, they move away with their children. And that actually affects the school attendance. And availability of milk due to drought, and which actually causes malnutrition. Here on the border to South Sudan, close to the ongoing conflict, many people have firearms in order to defend their watering holes and animals. Even the youngest carry weapons. The battle for water is now an everyday reality. Three days ago, there were conflicts where the, the communities were fighting over pasture along this water. And as you can see the area, there's drought, and so they have to cross over in search of pasture for their animals. So that uh, it comes along with uh, conflicts each and every time that there's drought in this region. Some NGOs like World Vision are active in the region, but they're not able to help everyone. The World Food Programme says it needs more than $40 million in emergency aid, and that is just to help the hardest-hit communities. <laughs> Lokutan Amala and this group of women are semi-nomadic. They've settled easily into their new home. Amala has gathered everyone to talk about the upcoming work in their new fields. 
With international funding, the NGO Pan Africa has drilled a well here and provided the women with a plot of five hectares. Each of them now has a piece of land where they can grow melons, vegetables and corn. I told everyone to work hard to grow their own food, for their own food security in the face of droughts. We have to work hard, very hard. Traditional practices like leaving pastures fallow no longer work here. The drought means the soil remains infertile even after a period of recovery. That's why farming projects like this are the best way to prepare against the consequences of climate crisis, according to drought expert Dennis Ong Cheng. That's one of the greatest uh, initiatives. And Katilu, in Trukana South, is an evidence that agropastoralism can work. Projects like this inspire hope. As the drought continues, an international donor conference has raised some $1.4 billion to provide relief to communities in Kenya, Somalia, and South Sudan. Staying on the topic of food security, our next report comes from an area of Ivory Coast also struggling with drought. Farmers there are now banding together to protect their fields from wind and unpredictable weather conditions. Here is this week's Doing Your Bits. How can we protect fields that are exposed to both drought and heavy rain? In northern Ivory Coast, farmers use two simple methods. The small stone walls they're building across their fields retain water. The walls don't run parallel, but snake back and forth. They use a level, not to check whether the ground is even, but to find out which way the land is sloping. The stones are then laid so that they will catch the water runoff. That allows us to fertilize the soil because the compost stays put and the ditches we have already dug can fill up with water. They have also planted trees to act as windbreaks. They are regularly pruned to keep them in check. The trees we planted help to shield the soil from the wind. The small walls we are building distribute the runoff so that the water doesn't wash away the soil and create deep channels, which would make the land useless in the long run. The farmers are now feeling more connected too. They realize they can only protect their fields together. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. We now head to a Spanish island off the coast of Morocco. In 2021, an extended volcanic eruption on the Canary Island of La Palma left entire villages buried beneath rivers of lava, destroying countless buildings, farmland, and vineyards in the process. But locals are determined to find a way to live with the volcano's legacy and rebuild their communities. Cleaning up efforts at the foot of the Cumbre Vieja in Las Manchas are in full swing. Tons of ashes need to be removed. Charo González Andrade is busy too. It's a special cleanup mission, but despite the hard work, she is relieved. Her village is still there. We're over the moon. We didn't think we'd come back. The eruption was so close, just over there. Firefighters and many volunteers have helped her to free the house from the ashes. But there is no running water at the moment. We were so scared that the house would collapse. Because of all those ashes there, a lot of pressure built up. 
Charo González Andrade and others here are optimistic that in a few weeks' time, life in Las Manchas will be almost normal again. Not far from Las Manchas, the aftermath is pretty clear. Whoa. A gigantic mass of lava has buried almost everything, including the village of Todoque, where Jose Garitano lived before. My house is literally a few kilometers from here, under the lava, but I cannot tell exactly where anymore. It's as if this is just one big black desert. It leaves quite an impression. The eruption of the Cumbre Vieja volcano has changed his life and that of thousands of palmeros forever. The lava has been destroying buildings and livelihoods. The architect Garitano wants to rebuild all of it, just where it once was, but on top of the lava. The whole of Todoque is geolocated digitally. It could prove to be complicated and difficult. And we don't even have an up-to-date map of the structure here. But yes, we will have a new landscape here. The lava is still hot, though. It will take a long time for it to cool down. In the meantime, scientists on the island of Tenerife are running tests to see if the ashes of the volcano can be used to make cement for the reconstruction. As far as I understand, the ashes are very clean. It could be perfect for construction. That would give houses and buildings a local touch too. The architect has a vision. He wants to fully rebuild Todoque to live a life right next to the lava. Everything that would be built on the lava could be sustainable and ecological. I also think that there can be a protected natural area for the lava. Jose Garitano wants to give back to the inhabitants of Todoque and other villages in the southwest of La Palma what the volcano has taken from them. Their homes and part of their identity. Of all the animals in the animal kingdom, hyenas are probably among those with the biggest image problem, perceived as mean, ugly, and ruthless. Hyenas are actually intelligent creatures who form clans with complex social hierarchies. And that is not all. While it is true that they are predators, they are also scavengers who play an important role in most African ecosystems. The Skeleton Coast in northwestern Namibia is home to brown hyenas, also known as strand wolves. Hyenas are very important in the ecosystem and they've got a very important role to play, but they portray it as the bad guys, and that's what people think about hyenas in general. We are forever killing our goats. Yet our hands are cut off and we can do nothing about it. But if the farmers come up and say, we are killing, now we are taking in our own hands. I understand the happen. We're now living in a nature reserve alongside wild animals. We can earn as much with them now as we do with goats and sheep, so I no longer shoot them. The hyenas are perfectly adapted to the extreme desert conditions and icy cold Benguela ocean current. Biologist Emzi Fevey has been studying the animals here for seven years and is still fascinated by them. She's a science coordinator for a tourism company that supports conservation projects in the region. I've got a lot of respect for hyenas because to survive as a large scavenger in the desert, it's, it's no mean feat. Um, and they're also very social. When they're out there, they're solitary. So you just see these single hyenas out there, but when they're back at the den, when there are um, cubs at the den, there's a lot of social going on. There's a lot of time spent with the cubs, playing with the cubs, grooming the cubs. Fairvey discovered a network of dens off the coast where packs of strand wolves gather to socialize and share their catch. 
They carry carcasses dozens of kilometers through the desert to feed to their cubs in the dens. Scavenger animals like these prevent diseases from spreading, making them important for livestock farming. But their reputation as predators means they're mercilessly hunted. People would put out poison for lions, for leopards, uh, cheetahs, and then the hyenas would be bycatch of that. Just people are afraid of hyenas, so people don't appreciate the value of brown hyenas, and they're scared of the hyenas, so people would, would throw stones at them, they would chase them with cars. Seven years of drought have ravaged the region. The animals here have to travel ever greater distances in search of food. This means they cross paths with farmers, like Emmanuel Gurirab, who are now losing more and more livestock to predators. Issue today. The incident took place at Farm Leokop in the Konada region last week, where two lions killed 66 goats and 10 sheep belonging to farmer Emmanuel Gurirab. As a result of the lion attack, Gurirab lost half of his herd, a sizable financial loss for the farmer. The government compensates farmers after such incidents, but at a rate around half of market value. The wild animals from the desert, the lions, the elephants, cause us a lot of problems. We don't gain anything from having wild animals here. They bring us nothing. Our livestock are our income, how we earn our living. Near his stall, Guri Rob has discovered fresh hyena tracks. Brown hyenas don't hunt goats, but the tracks could have been made by spotted hyenas, a more aggressive species. If the government doesn't take care of the hyenas, we have no choice. We have to shoot them. That's the plan. When he was a cattle herder, Phineas Casaona also killed hyenas and lions. Today, he protects them. He's a ranger and member of the Anabeb Community Reserve. Since the 90s, farmers like Casaona have joined neighbors to create their own nature reserves, which now cover about one-fifth of Namibia's landmass. Last night, elephants raided a neighbor's vegetable patch. So, for the next few nights, Casa Ona will stand guard. Despite the problems they cause, the farmers still want to protect the animals. Things have changed. Back in the day, if a hyena took one of your animals, you hunted it down and killed it. Today we live in a new world with laws that protect wild animals. And if we take care of them, we can even live from them. So we should try to live together. We do better then. Farmers have agreed on limiting livestock so that both wild and farm animals can coexist. Since antelope populations increased, attacks by wild predators have gone down. Anabeb earns its income from tourism and was able to install electricity and water connections and rebuild a preschool. Back on the Skeleton Coast, a ranger informs Fervey that an elephant calf is missing. The biologist fears the worst. She finds the calf halfway to a watering hole. Due to the ongoing drought, the mother couldn't lactate. There is no hope for the young elephant. Long periods of drought have made the fight for survival even harder here. Hyenas and other animals must search for new living environments. But with the help of researchers like MZ Fervei and community-based conservation efforts, there's still a chance in Namibia for people and animals to readapt and forge a life out of the desert.
and we can only hope they succeed. We've come to the end of this week's program. Thanks for watching and we look forward to seeing you all again next week. For now, it's goodbye from Lagos, Nigeria. And it is also time for me to sign off from Uganda. But don't forget to share your thoughts and ideas with us on all our social media platforms. We love to hear from you. Until next time, it is a bye-bye and do take care. No, oh, oh, oh.